We're very proud of that, and Alex has done incredibly well um, uh, for the Historical Society. Uh, we have this really great person that is going to be speaking to us on this really very, very important work, uh, which is about the history and the culture of Macedonia through its folk songs. And, and when I saw that, that it had been produced, I knew that I, I needed to get her here in Toronto. And um, just to tell you a little bit about her, um, she grew up in America at a time when being all American in, uh, evolved into celebrating heritage. She experienced both and found great interest in exploring the new culture, which her husband Joseph introduced her to. Her interest in Macedonian culture, history, started with Macedonian music. Upon meeting her husband in 1972, shortly after he moved to the U.S. from Kharev, Dvor, Macedonia, she was enriched with the opportunity to attend Macedonian dances. She fell in love with the music, and later her husband told her about the meaning in the lyrics. Her love with the meaning of the songs never ended, but resulted in a doctoral dissertation in 2001. Focusing on how Macedonian history, culture, language, and geography were quote unquote uh, taught through the folk songs, since then Kathy has published her research including the oral histories in a book called Embaba and the Vesta. Dr. Dimitrievsky's research includes oral histories from Macedonia, Pirin, Igeitska Macedonia, Mala Prespa, the US and Canada. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Kathy Dimitrievsky. Thank you. And thank you for having me here today, this lovely windy Toronto day. Uh, I'm glad you explained it all because that's the first question that I'm always asked is why did you like the songs? And you said it so very well. Uh, when I was picking out a subject for my dissertation for my PhD, I wanted to do something with education. I'm an educator. Uh, most of my life, elementary teacher, principal. And I was focusing on how the immigrants from Macedonian homes seemed to put a special emphasis on education, which many immigrant families do. And I started off there, and then I got into thinking about informal education and how when there was not a mandated school society, such in such as Macedonia pre-1950, uh, there were other ways to learn. And we know that through storytelling and song singing and, and uh, instruction we get from our elders that we do a lot of learning. And so I wanted to take a look at the informal education. Uh, and I chose the Macedonian society because I'm fascinated by it. And since I met my husband, who is in the back there, Joseph, if you can just wave. Um, <laughs> I really became interested in the culture, and uh, I would say I'm very passionate about it, especially with folk music. So that's what I decided to do my dissertation on. I had a wonderful mentor at the University of Buffalo who, said, who told me to go with my passion, do your dissertation. She said, you're going to live with it for a long time, so just do that. And so I did. I'd like to tell you that uh, I did publish the book, uh, which is the dissertation. And I called it Macedonia M. Baba M. Nevista because to me, Macedonia is a Baba. It is very, very old as a Narod and as a, as a Zemia. It's very, very old. And as a city, and not a city, but a country, it's very young because the independence is not very, very old at all. So I call that a Nevista. So you have the old, and you, yet you have some kind of a new country that has struggles going on. And yet you have a very old society that has been around forever. Um, in, my, in my study, I took a look at um, the Macedonian folk song and the Macedonian folk singing, how it was learned. And I looked at the importance of the song, and I looked at um, factors that may have inhibited singing of the song. Uh, I looked at different age groups. I looked at different sections of the Macedonia pre-1913, when Macedonia was all one. 
I looked at the immigrant societies. I went to Detroit. I came to Toronto. I looked in Buffalo in my backyard. I went on the internet and did surveys and, uh, and found out a lot about the songs and the singing. And then kind of put it all together and analyzed what I, what I found out. Um, it's about 600 pages. It's wonderful what I found out, and I wanted to share that with future generations, and that's why I published it. That's the reason I published it. I also was so fascinated by the oral histories that I collected that I gave the raw data in the back of the book. You can actually read the interviews. Um, the dissertation explores the role of the folk song over generations in the Macedonian society as a means of informal education. The focus is on the role of the folk song within family and community life, both in all parts of the ethnogeographic area known as Macedonia, parentheses I say pre-1913 Macedonia, and in the diaspora communities. I looked at both newly composed songs and the authentic folk songs known as Isborne music. I wanted to see um, not only what has been passed down from generations, but what is being passed down today. And again, it was a very oral-based society in Macedonia, so I took a look at um, researching in an oral-based society, and that's the methodology I applied. Um, I would say that most of the Macedonians in the uh, society and the groups that I interviewed uh, of the older generations were not very educated. Uh, most of their education was oral. And I do give one exception, and that's the group that exited Macedonia called the Detsabelsi. I think they had an opportunity that was unique in, in that they went to other countries and received very good educations. And uh, many of them ended up in Toronto and brought uh, their world experiences with them and brought with them a lot of benefit to the community in Toronto. The ways of transmitting culture and historical memory have been a very popular topic. I'm not the first researcher that has looked at uh, researching oral-based societies, but the particular focus on the folk song as a medium for transmission has had limited consideration. Um, although in a society like the Macedonian society, it held an eminent role, it was very important, but not so much researched for the use of it as an educational tool. Now, uh, when I attended the University of Buffalo, even though there are Macedonians in the community there, and it's not so far from, from uh, Toronto, and you would expect that we have a lot of educated people in the university, almost in every class I had to bring a map and explain where Macedonia was. I, I was with doctoral students who were asking me, where is Macedonia? Where was Macedonia? What are you talking about when you refer to Macedonians? So, not only is the knowledge of geography limited, but in particular, in the country of Macedonia. The importance to me is probably more relevant and more outstanding because I have a, we have a mixed marriage. I am American, my parents are, well my dad was an immigrant from Germany, he came on a boat many, many years ago. My mother's parents were from Sicily, but again she was uh, raised in America. We were a very American family. My father, my father's father fought against the U.S. in one war, but my father fought for the U.S. in the Second World War. And, uh, and we kind of were caught up on hot dogs and apple pie. Everything needs to be all American. You kind of play out, the, play down your own heritage. So in the 1970s when my husband came and started to evolve ethnic festivals and pride in your ethnicity, it took a big interest. Uh, when I was a young girl, uh, I remember on my German side of the family having to beg my aunt to teach me a folk song, a German folk song, and it, it's not something they shared willingly. You had to ask for it. And a lot of times, like I said, it was played down. So in a mixed marriage, I found very strange what you call adetsi. That's the first thing, you know, when I got married, it, it, was, it was shocking when I found it. I think I have a very open mind. So I would consider that very hard for some other mixed marriages. And I thought the more we write for people of mixed marriages, the easier the marriage could be, the stronger the marriage could be, the more they'll understand. And so I was interested in doing some writing as well for the benefit of those in mixed marriages. Um, the scarcity of writing I found when I started doing my literature research from a Macedonian lens 
seems to be a big problem. Um, at the University of Buffalo, there were 200 items on the shelves available, and there were where, where I was looking for um, materials, and there were fewer than 10 written from a Macedonian lens. In other words, Macedonian was spoken of in all of these books, but from the viewpoint of a Macedonian, uh, there were fewer than 10 that were available. So I realized also that there's a scarcity of writing from that Macedonian lens. Uh, nowhere, I'd like to mention in the songs that have been analyzed in my study, or in any other anthro um, anthologies that I examined, did the lyrics use any other word than Macedonian to identify themselves in the songs. So even though the, the Macedonians in the songs have a very clear identity, I found that in literature it is really being muffled over. It's not clear. So obviously there's a need for, for more writing. The lack of publication about Macedonia in English is an issue. There are many books, but they're in Cyrillic. For those who don't read Cyrillic, it's a problem. Especially for second and third generations, it's a problem because they don't speak the language. I had the opportunity to research uh, Macedonian folk songs in the annex parts, in Egye, in Pirin, in Mala Prespa. It was fascinating that I had the opportunity to cross into these borders and try to find out about uh, the Macedonian folk song, the Macedonian folk singing, when 10 years prior to that, that wasn't allowed. The people everywhere I turned were not only gracious, as Macedonians often are when you go to their home, but very welcoming and very um, eager to share their stories. And I would say that the human rights organizations in the countries I mentioned um, have had a lot to do with helping the Macedonians and also with getting the people able to speak their mother tongue. And I think you, you can see levels of openness. When I traveled, I know, especially the AG in Macedonia, some villages, some towns, there was more of an openness. In some places, they were afraid to speak or wouldn't contribute. But it varied, depending where you traveled in. One thing that I found that always could be problematic in folk singing and getting people to sing for you or talk is mourning. And it's the only thing I have found that stops Macedonians from singing is mourning. But I did have people in mourning because I, because I was doing research uh, who agreed to sing for me. And if not, they gave me the lyrics. So I was very lucky that. The questions I posed was what role did the folk song play in the community and the family life? For the, of the Macedonian people in the Republic of Macedonia, the Annex parts, and the Diaspora. When, where, why did singing occur? Who sang? What difference was there depending on the following variants? Gender, generation, village versus town or city, annexation, immigration. I wanted to know what songs most frequently emerged as the favorites to Macedonians, and what do they represent? What cultural and historical themes are most prevalent in the songs? from an analysis of the lyrics, and from an analysis of the singing, and also from the internet surveys. And why was the folk song important in the Macedonian society in the past, and is it important today? That's what I looked at. Um, I, did, I did a literature review, and I will just say that I started out with um, other samples of folk singing, such as in America, we sing happy birthday. They also sing in Macedonia, too. <laughs> but. Um, I found out that there are certain songs in other cultures that are folk songs. In America, in New York State in, in particular, we always learned about the history of the Erie Canal with the song Erie Canal. And so we were learning history that way. And so you will find in other cultures, uh, it's also important, the folk song. Now, I went into next a, a brief historical overview of Macedonian history. I'm not here today to explain that to you, and there's a lot of points I'm going to skim over because it's such a long study. And I wanted you to get the gist. If there are questions you'd like to ask afterwards, or if you want to sit around and chat, I'll be glad to. The history is in the book. It goes from way back to 489 BC, and I talk all the way up to today about a brief history. But what's more interesting is the history that emerged from the songs later. The, the history in the literature review obviously is from literature. I analyzed 35 folk songs in the uh, in the book. And I mentioned many, many, many more. And the 
uh, analysis included coding the songs. I would code them for what kind of theme they had, and I'll go through those themes with you. I dated songs as much as I could, tried to find out from what century they were. Uh, for example, I traced the roots of the song Biliana Platno Beleche. I looked at the song Frosina. I looked at the other, some of the other songs that which ones came out in 1950, which ones are 1850, and tried my best to place them and, and use them for some historical purpose. Uh, the representation is very important of the song. I, I say that this analysis should be recognized as, re as representation of centuries of Macedonian culture and history as told by Macedonian folk through their songs. It in no manner implies a final word on any song as to do no insult to the people of a different region who may have treasured a different version of a song, or whose personal lives may have added even deeper meaning to the word. It is my hope that this analysis will allow the reader to hear the voice of the Macedonian peasant in the fields, under oppression, in battle, in love, in loss, in illness, in separation caused by the sojourner's travel, and in the longing for unification. The interview sites that I went to, I mentioned briefly, at my husband's village is Tsarapur. That was my kind of uh, headquarters. My, his parents have a, a house there, and, and I centered my, myself there. And they even installed a telephone for me, which I was very appreciative of. And I was able to connect the laptop to it. I did some research that way as well. Um, I spent a lot of time in Vitola. I went uh, to many places. I saw the geography of the country. And I also saw so many sites and churches and monasteries. I did not bring any of that with me today. It would take me a week or two to explain all that. But I want to focus on the songs now. I went to Stief, spent some time there, and you talked about Alexander Donsky. He was a great host for me, and he brought a lot of meaning to my work and helped me in great, great measures. But also other people, other professors in Macedonia that I can mention. I went to Skopje. Skopje, I, I also, um, did some work with some of the organizations, like the Ministry of Emigration helped me greatly in Skopje. And I interviewed, and it's later in my book I explained this, I interviewed Petrarca Kostadinova, I interviewed Violeta Tomovska, Alexander Sarievsky, and these interviews are in my book. I almost interviewed Vaska Ilieva, but she was ill, so we did that by telephone when I came back. Wonderful interview from, uh, well, I don't think any of them. Uh, Violetta is still alive. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of interest from the media when I went to Macedonia. That one thing I didn't expect or plan for was interviews. And I had to squeeze it in, and it really curbed my schedules. Television, radio, um, magazine interviews. It was every week I was getting, I, I was there one summer, and every week I was getting calls for interviews, and I was meeting people at coffee shops. And I went on the national TV um, on Good Morning Macedonia, or simil something similar to that title. And there was a lot of interest in my work. And I was very proud at the response of the Macedonian media. Um, I looked at uh, different, uh, different villages. I looked at, as I told you, uh, towns. I went into towns. And I also um, was in the bigger city. Uh, and I looked at the different songs that people um, sang, and I just want to make a brief comment that when I was in Egye, I also had the chance to attend a Slava. Actually, it was something that a, a quick call on the phone said, you want to go into Greece? We're going to, we're going to go down to the Macedonian villages, and we're going to uh, attend this great big Slava. Went down there and was amazed. It had to be over a thousand people at the Slava, outdoors dancing in a region where I was told it was very restrictive to use the Macedonian language. It was very restrictive with dancing. And I was amazed at the openness, the joy that they expressed, and the patriotism that was going on openly. Again, it wasn't the same in every village I visited, but it was there. And some of the songs they were singing at the dance, Yasum Chisto Makedonchi, Stamana, Kadesi Makedonchina, it's wonderful to hear, and it was all in Macedonian with a Greek accent. <laughs> it was very interesting to watch this. Uh, I have a few video clips later, well, I have quite a few video clips later to share with you, and there'll be one from that if you're interested. Now I'd like to talk about these. Uh, 
we talk about ancient roots, such as Alexander the Great. And so I looked for a song, well, actually, I, I found a song that uh, addressed that, and I talk about that in my book, The Ballad for Alexander Makedonsky. Another theme that came out of the song, and when I say themes, I look at folk songs that are collected, and that I get from the people, and I put a theme on them. I say, this is cultural. This one has to do with um, history. This happens to be uh, maybe more of a song for Petchalma. And I give it a code, and then I take them all together and um, analyze what I have. Um, life in Ottoman Empire, in the Ottoman Macedonia, the 500 years under the Turkish rule. Maria Mlada Nevesto, a song from the Sheep area. Uh, Frosina, another song. Very, very important. And, uh, to the culture at that time, and to the struggles of the Macedonia under the Ottoman Empire. Theme three out of the songs, the land. When you talk about land, when you talk about uh, how important the land is, even say Zahali, Pile, Treno, Odaichicho, how important that document was that they owned the land. And uh, different things, they talk about geography, they named the cities, they named Planina, Shar Planina, in many songs. Um, I looked at a, a, the earliest um, fighters, the Ayutzi, and uh, songs like Dapino Vino Serbano, and different songs that bring out the Ayutzi. And I learned what they were, and I learned <coughs> how they fought, and I learned that you know they didn't fight in the winter, and things like that. Just so, so many interesting details. Then I looked at the revolution, and I looked at uh, songs, again, that um, talk about the struggle with the Turks. and the, I talk about the Yanichari, and I talk about the, about the Kumite in the book. Um, I have heroes in the book. Go to Delchev, Yanni Sandowski, I mentioned them. Again, coming out of the songs, emerging out of the songs. I talk about the uh, Enlightenment, and I talk about how uh, the growing ideology of Marxism and, and other things coming out of France, Paris, influenced people, and I talked about the teachers like Gose Delchev and Nikola Karev, and talked about how that all grew into an enlightenment. Talk about the, the, the uh, organization, the Taina Makedonska Revolutionary Organizatia, um, as being the root of the revolution. And I also talk about the young Turkish revolution. So I have a lot of songs about the heroes of the revolution. Kofanali, Kleti, Turkse, different songs about Kote Delchev, Yanni Sandansky, Alexander Turingev, Doncho, Stepian Cheto. I have a lot of songs about the, the, those uprisings. And each song goes into detail about the lyrics, and I explain the lyrics. Songs about Brezevo, uh, songs about 19 and, uh, 1908. Uh, I talk about, another theme I talk about is the world wars and fascism. And I talk about the song, Zaplakalo Seloto Vatasha, and the, the innocent blood, the bloodshed of innocent children um, that took place that. And then I talk about the cult of patriotism, songs that want to make the Macedonian more patriotic. Um, I talk about women and the widows of war, songs that uh, made mothers cry because they lost their sons in war. And the World War II and the Partisans. I talk about tears, I call it tears from Aegean Macedonia. Uh, the unification and the national identity, the, especially currently, the songs that are emerging, the newly composed songs about um, identity and about uh, the reunification of Macedonia, whether it's not practical, whether it's not uh, desired or not, it, just the songs that are emerging. I talk about Petchova, I talk about people traveling to um, America, Australia, different places in the world, and the hardship that brought on the families. And then some other themes are love songs, talk about the weddings, the engagements, the unusual uh, practices that uh, might be found when a boy likes a girl, and I talk about places that they, they were singing songs as well. I also mention customs that have taken place once they crossed the ocean, such as in communities like this, the wedding customs the engagement. I also talk about that in the book. I talk about illness, which is a, a very 
a prevalent theme. You can see songs written about people that are sick. Holidays. Um, mention, you know, so a lot of songs have the mention of whiskey and wine, and I talk about that. I talk about humor. I talk about blood revenge, when one family will go after another because uh, someone in their family was murdered. Exceptional type of findings that are unusual. And I also talk about something called brain begging. I found out that when it was a very, very dry summer, they used to dress up children. Uh, they would have to be orphans, and they would dress them up with leaves and things, and they would beg for rain, and then rain would come. And I found in different regions of Macedonians that that was, that was coming out in the interviews, rain begging. Part of my video later on has got a very interesting uh, two interviews that mentioned rain begging. Um, and then about folk singing. When I'm looking at folk singing, I'm looking, how did the people in the family sing? Who was teaching? And most often it was the devil, the baba, the mother and father. The um, family was an extended family. And so there, one household we found there were 22 people. And um, they would pass the songs along and they would work together and play together and the songs emerged. That has changed when families started to be in individual units more and more, not living with the in-laws. Um, you didn't have that opportunity. You didn't have that social gathering as much, and so you didn't have as many songs being taught in that way, replaced by listening to songs on radio and CD in the, in the later years. So, so that was a big thing, the family. And I talked about family structure, like I just said, that changed. The learning of folk songs some I'll read to you that Alexander Saryevsky told me. The songs are always tied to something that happened that was, not just made up, whatever. Comedy, history, all those things happened. Now someone at that time thought of the song and brought it forward. Someone thought it, sang it as they could. That is history. A child can learn with lessons in interpretation, vocalization. They need to understand what they're singing. You can learn language as you do through literature. Most of all, one can learn from the songs. If you have an interest, little by little, you will learn much. You can understand things from all the songs. And this is something he said, but it was repeated many times in the interviews. One of the things also was the labor. When people were going, you know, go back to when they were reaping wheat, the Jetharsky songs. When they were reaping wheat and they were singing, the Argathi, the paid workers that were bored in the fields. And so to make it a little easier on themselves, they would sing. One lady in Mala Prespa told me she sang from Maka. She had so many hardships that she wanted to forget about and distract herself, so she would sing. And as technology changed, so did the folk song. The emergence of uh, factory work under the Yugoslav government changed people's life. The, even in Prespa, the fact that it went from wheat fields to apple orchards changed lives. The fact that tractors were brought in and people weren't walking to the fields they were on these noisy tractors, uh, couldn't even hear each other sing, let alone um, have the time, because they were quickly taken to the fields. The technology changed how we sang and when we sang. Um, even water. No longer do people go to the wells to pull out the water. They turn on a faucet. So you don't have the singing around the water wells. So technology does change a lot of things. Singings happened at Sedankis and also at the Slavas. Uh, when people would get together in the village to uh, chuck corn, string tobacco, or do any other kind of farm work together, and a lot of times they were doing it to save on kerosene. They would go under one lamp instead of 10 individual ones in their, in their village, or their section of the village. There was a common gathering Somebody would start singing a song, usually one who loved to sing. There's somebody in every family who loves to sing. And then other people would join in. Singing at weddings. Singing also in the armed forces. When they were marching, they were actually singing partisans. And later on in the Second World War, when they were marching from place to place, that's how they would pass the times. They would sing. And sometimes, even for spirit, even to get that, that spirit up to be able to fight, to be strong, they would sing. And I talked to you a little bit about this morning and the silencing of the song. 
there was prohibition of the song in different sections, especially in Ediesco Macedonia and in Pirinsco Macedonia. Found that there was a lot of times when they weren't able to freely sing a song. It's changed now, but there were times when they couldn't. Uh, one man in Piran told me, before the democracy, I was a musician. I played different kinds of music, any kind. The Bulgarian police told me, this one you can't play and that one you can't sing. I told them, if you stick me to leva, which is Bulgarian currency, I'll sing whatever you want me to. And we were all laughing at that. And he said, but in Bulgarian, in the Bulgarian language, we were allowed to sing. Macedonians, as we said, these are his words, were, was prohibited. Bulgarian patriotic songs for Christo Botev or Shopsky. You would never have heard a Macedonian song in school. They trained the kids from young to be loyal to Bulgaria. Here the Macedonian song was forbidden. It was forbidden from 1945. In 1957, when I was 17 years old, I needed a passport. On the application I wrote Macedonian as my ethnicity. They made me switch it to Bulgaria. In 1966 they made up all of us then register as Bulgarians. I was against it, but to no avail. Also in September 1966, there were no videos or cassette players then. I bought five or six Macedonian records at the border concert, as it was illegal to play the Macedonian music. The Bulgarian police would send people to listen in as spies to find out who was playing the music at home. Then they would summon you to the station and they would confiscate the records. The P Bulgarian police then took the records and they played them themselves, he said. <laughs> So, you know, different stories, different parts. Um, I asked him, well, in those days, if I came and sit with you, we were sitting outside, by the way, for this interview. It was very open. And I said, if I came and sat with you and asked you the questions, how would it have been? He said, you would have never been here. You just wouldn't have been here. He said, it's different today. You're coming in the year 2000. He said, those days you wouldn't have been here. Um, this one's from Eggy. Someone who lives in Macedonia, the Varda region now, but was born in Ege. Uh, when I was a young girl, I would listen to the older girls. They'd sing songs quietly in Macedonia, so they wouldn't be heard. It was great terror. That's why the people were very, very afraid. Little by little, the villages were emptied out. After that came the Second World War, Second Civil War, which the Macedonians called the people's fight for freedom. We fought for our freedom, independence, to gain our human rights. We would sing when we were reaping in the fields, but quietly. We were afraid to sing. When there was a wedding, they would sing, but quietly. They shouldn't be heard from the outside that they were singing in Macedonia. Um, now, in Shtip, we prepared for, this is a different person, we prepared for the shows, Kostana and Somnilepo, Litze. We took the show into Bulgaria. My wife, someone from Shtip is talking, my wife, I had an aunt there whom I wanted to visit. I had her address on me. I was very concerned she would be confiscated at the border. And she goes on to talk. So there's some of these fears that they had that uh, hopefully, little by little, are disappearing. Um, there was an issue in Vardar Macedonia, and I learned this from singers, about newly composed songs uh, around 1960, that they weren't popular and the radio stations didn't want them. They wanted just the folk songs. They didn't want anybody coming up with some new things. So there was a little bit in Vardar about the restriction of the song, but not so great as the other sections. Here's something my father-in-law told me. Uh, he said in the 1940s until early 1960s, his village, which was in Vardar, Sarvor, had speakers on the electric poles at intersections. And he said he worked in the radio station and every morning and evening, there were two to three hours of music, Macedonian, um, not only. It was very good. Also very important is which sections had radio transmission. For example, if you were in a certain part of what is now Albania, Malaprespa, certain villages caught the signal from other places in Vardar. Certain villages did not, did not. So certain villages knew more songs, perhaps, than other ones, in addition to the regionality of songs. Uh, so the radio before the days of television was very important, and where you caught signals differed on how many songs you heard or what you knew. Uh, I asked if people thought that history was transmitted, culture was transmitted. I found that it was, but I asked their opinion, 
and they agreed. They said it really was. And, but you do see songs changing in, in the text over generations. Um, I mean, you have the song Stamina now, you know, she, her, her mother's sick and she gets her water. Well, there was a song, Draga and Kabul no Lake Nila. And you can see how it goes back. You can also do that with uh, Billy on Plat Nobelche. And if you go back a century, it was Draga. So it changes. And in Bulgaria, they made it uh, Biliana Bella Bukarka. They changed it again. So you can see that wherever you go, folk songs change. That's one of the definitions of folk songs, that where people take them, the lyrics may change a little bit. Uh, you can learn culture through the folk songs. You can learn about, um, you can learn about history. I remember one time, we had this Macedonian mind store fixing our basement, and he was playing his cassettes, and I was interested, of course, and said, what does that mean? What do you mean, Kushri? What are those? Tell me about that. What do you mean, bullets? You know, and we would get to a conversation about Idusi, and then we'd be half hour later talking about, you know, Kumiti. And this is how you just ask one word from a song, and you can learn so much. Just pick one word out, and it can turn into an hour conversation. Patriotism. Pachalba, um, we talked about how there was certain, what fascinated me, there was a certain tree on the, on the path from Sarvor to Resin where people stopped accompanying the fellow who was going to the other country wherever they were going off. They stopped at that point and said goodbye and then they went along their way. And there was a tree there, a Gornitsa, and they said that tree was named Plachi Gornitsa because everybody would cry there and say goodbye. And just these stories just come out. One thing I found is everybody wanted to tell their story. When I would say, tell me a little bit about your family before I ask you about folk songs, that was two hours. They all want to tell their story. The immigrants love folk music. I found that whenever I did in the DS4 any research, a big love for folk music. Uh, and you can see a difference. I, I noticed this more in the old country of women and men, the difference in songs. They, they tend to sing, and I suppose it's the same thing here. I mean, we tend to say women like certain movies when they go to the theater, and men might choose different ones, and they have different tastes. Um, the prevalent things with men would be patriotic songs, and with women, it tends to be more love songs. Uh, but you, you see men and women familiar with all kinds of songs. The survival of the Macedonian folk song is incredible. And it's because of the people's will and the love for the song that no matter how many people were um, persecuted or told not to sing, or how many people didn't sing because somebody was dead in their family, or how much technology has changed, <coughs> it persevered. And I also talk about the heroes of the folk song because I believe that the bands that play the ethnic, the ismornate, the folk music, the authentic music, are doing such a service to the Macedonian culture. And the bands that kind of just played all the modern music are not. I, I really feel that the bands should concentrate more on the folk songs because they have the opportunity to keep it alive. The young people love the bands. It's a given. So while they're dancing, teach them some culture and history. Play some of the old songs. I talk about the ethnic festivals that happen here, and the ethnic festivals in Macedonia, like Vitovsky, Tetilidensky, Denovi, a wonderful dance and music festival that really keeps the culture alive. The Galichka Svadba, if you want to see an old-fashioned wedding where they go and take the bride from the village. It was a wonderful experience I had when I was there. And um, any of the festivals that have to do with the same days, um, very, very important. Now, I did internet surveys, and I also did surveys when I, informal surveys when I did interviews. Asked, what is the most, what's your most favorite song of Macedonian? I will tell you just right now, not the oldest song, but the most favorite is Makedon's with Demoche in the whole world. Second is Zaidi Zaidi Yasno Sonse, a song that I learned to love. Biljana Platno Falashe, I'm only going to tell you 10, I have over 60 here. Bitola Moirod and Krai, Snoshti Pominev, Pokrai Bazi. Some of these are new compositions, some are folk songs, because people kind of tend to mix them. Koga Turgno Sveto Botugina, Visar Balkansky, 
slušam kaj šuma, šumite, bukite, sestro, brata, kani na večera, pileto mi pej rano na sabajle, tugi na pusta da ostani, Jovano je vake, zemljo makedonska, čerešna se od koren, koren še, known everywhere, young, old, internet, every section where there's Macedonians, know that song. Uči mi majko karame, pavle mi pije, despina, another beautiful song. More i soko pije, poslušajte, a trio pije. These, I just went to 20, but there's more and more songs. Those are the favorites, and I asked the favorite singers, and I got the same ones that I interviewed. Vasca, Alexander, Violeta, Petranta, they came up again. And I, and I asked, you know, how they learned the folk songs, and, you know, we're talking about the radio, we're talking about their father, their mother, community events, cassettes. So many people don't still have CD players, but some responded on CDs. I also interviewed uh, students at the University of Vitola, gave them the survey as well. So this has a very wide participant group in it. Uh, why did Macedonians sing? sing? It was a way to pass their time. It made life easier. They wanted to express party loyalties and patriotism to their motherland, to preserve their identity, to express their emotions. And those people that promoted the songs are what I refer to as keepers of the song. Uh, the role of the folk song, in addition to that, is a big transmitter of historical information and cultural value. So it does have a basis in education as an informal educator. I really believe that um, groups should promote the East Borne folk songs. I, I, I really believe that uh, more folk history should, should focus on the songs. Grants, grants should be given to organizations like this that would like to pursue more interest on the folk songs. Or um, perhaps to uh, have students study to make musical bands that focus on this. Um, the families can uh, pass on folk songs, take the time to teach your children and grandchildren some of these songs. And also, um, playing Macedonian music in your car, in your, in your home, is very important, but you have to explain what the lyrics means, because you don't really get much just out of the song unless you understand. And if you understand, you will understand the Macedonian history and culture. But you have to explain it to them. I wrote this book in English first. I have an interest in translating it into Macedonian because I was thinking of the second and third generation really need to learn a lot about their culture and about the songs. The, the book has the 35 songs that were analyzed in English and in Macedonian. So people who are going to hear the lyrics in Macedonian, they can translate from there. And then finally, you'll have a, bi a bibliography of a lot, a lot of books people could read to learn more. Uh, and I would like to have the opportunity to show you a little bit of video clips and take some questions. But I also did collect some of these songs for you to give you a sample. I have a CD in the back. and. Um, I have, I'll tell you the songs that are on the CD because it's not mentioned, it's kind of, I put it together with just a label. Zaidi Zaidi Yasno Sonse, Inias Medetsa, Na Makedonia, Makedonsko Devojce, Bolto Majčiska, Od Vrp Pirin Planina, Aide Slušaj Slušaj, Kalesh Preangio, Jovano Jovanke, Tesh Koto. This is not a song, but it was so important to the people leaving on Petrova. Mizak Plakala, Selato Vatasha, I mentioned that. And no ime ima me raz delbata. No, raz bolela se lenka pingova. I chose that song because it was particular from the Shtip area. And and I tried to get songs from different areas. Sno Shtimina, Pokrai Vazi, Karahodot, Pristigna, Eleno Kerko Elena, Sestra Vrata, Molina Ventura, Zaventura. The song about the Dead Zavelgalci, Kadeste Matadonchina, Pogapanda Napirin, Rana Piana Shranetsi. You have to admit. Well. So I'd like to stop there. A few questions first, and I'll also stay around afterwards, okay? Questions? Yes? Do you see a more um, trend in Macedonia to sort of like American or 
not American, Western style uh, modern pop music, changing our folk music, um, like the folk music sort of losing ground to modern pop style. I don't know if it's Western or Eastern though. Western music influence, yes. Um, they would love you if you bring them NSYNC tapes and things like that. Uh, they, the young, the young love it, but I don't think they mix it with the folk songs. I think they see it as two separate things. They don't, the young people don't know the folk songs over there as well, but they're getting, they, there's a, you know, the, I don't know if you still get the uh, satellite channel, channel one from, do you get it in Toronto? Channel one from Macedonia? Okay, it was one time I heard they were bringing it. Uh, the commercials, little commercial breaks have folk songs. Wonderful. They're taking advantage, instead of a commercial, they, they'll sing a song or two. Um, this is where the kids are getting it. Not so much in the school. They might have a little in music class, as much as I learned here at Canal. But mostly, uh, yes, they do like the modern music. It's not mixed in the folk song. Where the folk song is getting mixed up is from more of the Oriental music, which I think is more Eastern. Um, we've heard Joe call it the Shaka Naka stuff. You know, the stuff that say, you hear at the dances, they're, they're really going really fast with these songs just to dance around. They change it. They've changed songs. Um, that Vino, Vino Servino's changed. They got two versions of it, right? Um, I'm, I'm, there, there's many, many songs like, um, you know, the song about, what is it, Big Hila Banana? You know, you know, just fast stuff to dance to. So sometimes they mix it into the, an old folk song. Sometimes it gets mixed. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes just the melody changes the beat a little bit. So I don't think it's mixed in so much. But I think it's being replaced. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the music is being replaced by more modern pop, Western pop, with the young kids. Yes? Uh, first, I'd like to express my feelings that uh, I, <clears throat> First, I'd like to express my feelings that today uh, I enjoyed very much your presentation. And I can see the sincerity in your work. Uh, and I would like to congratulate you for this because we need work like this. And at the same time, I was just a little bit touched with one uh, uh, segment you mentioned about the singing in the Asian part that the Macedonian new, new generation, they were singing, but with a Greek dialect. The singers. The yeah. singers. Mm -hmm. Uh, the old Macedonian people, I, I presume. Yes. Uh, from the scientific point of view, was that a, an accident because they learned the, the, the Greek language? Or uh, there was a dialect of Macedonian speaking in that part of uh, the region comparing to the new <coughs> language, literally language? I think I understand your question well. If I don't, please tell me. Uh, my belief, these are people who are Macedonians in blood, no heritage, that learn to speak Greek in school and are pronouncing it like I pronounce Macedonian. You know, they have a bit of an accent. Uh, wherever I traveled, they knew where I was from. You know, but this is what I think it is. It's not anything else. The Greek language and the Macedonian language are so different. So it was the accent they had, which really was interesting. It was an interesting take on the, you know, the, what was most interesting though is the, the lyrics they were singing. I'm a, I'm a clean Macedonian, you know, all the way through. Pure, better word, pure Macedonian. And this is in Greece, they're singing these lyrics. And you know, from all the things I heard, I heard of persecutions and tongue piercings. And, and I thought, oh my goodness. And when I go and see them express this, and Basket Yulieva, her current comments in the book, you need to read, how she said they were just going wild when she was singing there. And um, it's, just, it's just amazing. And people should be proud of their heritage. They really should. And that's what I enjoy so much about my husband's culture, because I didn't grow up with that in America. I grew up with you water down your culture. So um, yeah, I think it was definitely just because of their schooling. And I did hear many, many stories about when um, not exactly the first year, but maybe 10, 20 years after the annexation of Macedonia into Greece, 
um, the efforts of the uh, Greek educational, if you want to say, government system to put all the children in gradinas and really instill the Greek language from small uh, babies until they grew up. And of course, that would make them better students and better citizens. And I would see that they probably do that in America too. But uh, that language was embedded. So they speak Greek, but they also speak Macedonian. Please stay and see the interview of a little boy at that Slava. My husband thinks I have. He, he, I was talking to somebody else, and he went and interviewed a little boy and asked him just his name to see if he could speak Macedonian. Just a couple words. But to see him, you know, what's your village name? Now, how would you say that in Macedonian? How would you say it in Greek? Just, it's inspiring, you know, that somewhere he's getting some Macedonian. I'm just curious, when were you there and when were this? This is 2000, summer of 2000. Of course, my knowledge of the Macedonian folk songs goes back 30 years. I just, we just had our 30th wedding anniversary. So, and then I knew him a few years before that. So about, you know, my knowledge goes back, but this research took place in the year of 2000. Well, I, I think I have cousins that are still there. Uh -huh. and, uh, they speak both Greek and Macedonian. Yes. But the Macedonian, as I think you were trying to say, was is not the same as what is, there is a different accent and a different dialect. We argue about it, those of us oh, who are. let me address that. I'm a very good participant in the research of my own because I have no Macedonian roots. I learned to speak the dialect of Presla from Sarafor Resin area. And that's really what I know. So when I went, for example, to say, Etape, you know, when I go to Shtip, they say, Etaka. You know, it's a different accent altogether. So I listen a lot and try to get the difference there. The easiest place for me to understand the Macedonians was two places, Egesco and uh, Mala Presma, where the language was so preserved in Italy. The easiest place for me to understand it. So I'm a very good, I think, research subject because I have no prior Macedonian. And I know my Macedonian is, is Presma. Okay? So these were the two areas. So I think the dialect there is similar to the dialect used in Bardar in the Presma area. And also the dancing was very easy to pick up. So I'm not sure, but I'm sure that because dialects are different all over, that if somebody from Shtip went to Egid to do some research, it would be a different story. Does that help at all? Well, I guess I'm questioning why the comment that it was a Greek accent, speaking Macedonian with a Greek accent, and maybe there was a community there that, but I still think that in many cases they learned Macedonian simultaneously. At, the at, 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 at home, exactly. yeah. They learned at home. Okay, let me tell you, let me compare it with this. Here's a parallel. The Macedonians in Buffalo, from Macedonian homes, mom and dad both Macedonian. The child has an American accent when he speaks Macedonian. Um, I'm going to point out somebody, I hope I don't embarrass my, my husband's cousin with me today, Kerry, a good supporter. Thank you very much. He and his wife speak Macedonian all the time in the home. And um, their son, to me, when I speak English to him, has, or Macedonian, has a Canadian accent to it. So I just think from being immersed in that country, you pick up an accent. I don't think it's taught to you at home or anything. I think it's just from being, especially educated in the schools. We pronounce phonic, phonetically. We teach the children to get that. Please. Um, I'd, like, I'd like people to be able to uh, partake of some Macedonian tea. Uh, and also, that way they can, uh, they can watch the video and then be at the same time. That doesn't mean that she can't continue with some more questions, that's for sure. But I just wanted to make it a little bit more comfortable for you because I know that I, that tea was driving me crazy, actually. <laughs> and uh, so, and I also wanted to thank Kathy for coming on behalf of the Historical Society because this has really been an important piece of research as far as I'm concerned, as Tony has pointed out. And, uh, and we certainly are open for some more questions, etc. We have to leave here at a certain time, but there's lots, uh, there's lots of time yet to, to watch the video, 
ask her some more questions because I know that the other people would like to hear the answers. But I'd like to present this to you on behalf of the Historical Society and uh, because we, we want to make sure that we honor our, uh, our speakers and lecturers. It certainly is not to the extent that we would like to make it, but still, um, it is an honor for us to have you here. I'm here on a volunteer basis. I yes. don't need anything. I know, I but that's anything. okay. It's up to you. Thank you very much, but please continue. <laughs> Step up for a few minutes, and then come back and have uh, have some tea, and then uh, then perhaps uh, uh, Kathy could have probably be the first to get that yes. shot. Yes. Before, I would like to just comment that when you see the video, you won't know exactly where it is. I would just announce the place where it took place, okay, or where the people are from. I'll, I'll, that's the only thing I'll say. I want you to witness it for yourself, but just so you know where this is. 